Shalom, shalom, everybody. Ariel Baratzadok here from the Kosher Torah School, found online at koshertorah.com. I am here with my beloved Sierra. She's sitting right here. Say hello, Sierra. There's Sierra. <laughs> yeah. See, what you don't see on off camera here is here. Let me go grab these here. Is our little Purim snacks. You see? This is, this is what Sierra wants. So you know what? Before we get busy with stuff here, I'm going to give Sierra a little snack. Why? Consider it, if you will, a little Purim Simcha. You know we give Mishloach Manot on Purim? Well, here we go. I'm giving Sierra her little Mishloach Manot. There we go, darling. Okay, are we happy now? No, she wants more. You know, with text, God rest his soul, he had such a... Uh, a bad stomach. I couldn't give him these things. But Sierra, she doesn't have such a problem. <laughs> she can eat her way through anything. Now go lie down and let Daddy do his class, okay? You want to say hello again to everybody? You want to say hello online? Yeah? Okay. For those of you who don't know, here at our Kosher Torah School, uh, for those of you who have been with us for years and years, you might remember my doggy text. There's Sierra. Say hi. And I've always had my dogs here in class. And some people say, well, that's not very professional. And you know my attitude on that. It's very Butlerian. How many of you remember the character Rhett Butler from the famous movie Gone with the Wind? And the last line that he had in the movie when he was breaking up with Maureen O'Hara's character, Scarlett O'Hara, when he said, frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. And it was such a shock to hear that word. Well, you know something? When it comes to telling the truth about Torah and mitzvot and the reality of life, my attitude is butlerian, meaning, like Rhett Butler, I don't give a damn about the political correctness and the lies and the nonsense that goes on out there. And especially now with this holiday of Purim, this is the time to get politically incorrect. For me, it's being proper, but for others, maybe not. So, with no further ado, and as Darth Vader would say, to dispense with the pleasantries, let's get down to business. We're here tonight. I want to discuss with you what's happening in the world, what's going on with Purim, and to make some, as always, political incorrect statements about what's happening in the world. Now, first off, we're all familiar with the Purim story. I don't need to talk about King Ahasuerus, what happened with Vashti the Queen, how she got booted out, how Esther rose up, how the evil Haman came along and wanted to kill all the Jews because Mordecai wouldn't bow down to him, and how it all turned around that Haman got exposed, Esther was a Jewess, the king chose his wife, hung up Mordecai, and the Jews uh, killed all their enemies, and everybody had a party. Now, we, we all know we're going to read this story in the synagogue. We all know it a hundred times over. So what more is there to, to talk about? And the answer is I don't need to talk about what the book says. If you want to read the book of Esther, I mean, good gosh, just Read it. How hard is it? It's a story. Now, there is, of course, secular questions whether or not the story is historical. Some will say it's a novel, a novella. Well, you know something? I don't buy that. I'm going to tell you why. The book of Job, that actually was a novel, a story. There was no historical Job. But we could tell by the nature of the literary style of the book of Job, that it's novellic. But the book of Esther lacks that type of style. It reads and relates with specific types of details which indicate its historicity. According to most opinions, uh, the Ahasuerus character of the book of Esther is the historical Xerxes I. Many of you might be familiar with Xerxes I as a recent portrayal of him in the graphic uh, movies, the 300, 
uh, which showed the Persian attack on Greece. And of course, he was portrayed as this seven foot pseudo god and the like. Well, <laughs> it's, it's a shame we couldn't take the historical Xerxes and bring him forward to see how he's portrayed in the film. I think he would find it more hilarious than we would. Uh, look anything like that at all. But, you know, why, why should anyone ever question Hollywood <laughs> as having anything to do with political or historical reality? If anyone can actually blur and destroy history, that's Hollywood for you. Hollywood rewrites anything and everything, every which way they want, all the time, and that is the confusion of minds. The historical Xerxes, yeah, he did attack Greece. Go, go study the history of Sparta and Leonidas. He did actually stand up. He didn't die in, in you know like they showed in the movie he actually died in the second day of the uh, of the offense but what's actually curious is the spartan israelite connection go back into the book of maccabees and you will find that i think it was judah maccabee received an ambassador from sparta who was offering military assistance because of some alleged israelite spartan connection and that's rather curious, because if you look in ancient Hebrew and even Greek sources, gosh, forgive me that I can't quote you the source of this, but if you Google it out there, it's somewhere to be found. As we know, Abraham Avinu um, had uh, a, a wife towards the end of his life named Keturah. And I believe it is that one of the sons of Keturah uh, supposedly traveled to Greece, and somehow I think it was either his son or his daughter, I forget the actual details, but somehow, somewhere, the son or grandson of that Abrahamic child was, according to the stories, the historical Hercules. Hercules, as we know, was the you know legendary founder of Sparta. So, isn't it nice to know the mighty Hercules is... A cousin <laughs> of Israel. So if you ever watch those old gladiator movies from the 50s and the 60s, and you see all those muscle men portraying like Hercules and Samson. <laughs> How many of you remember from the 60s, the old Sons of Hercules movies? <laughs> I think they're like, like gay icons today. But in the time, in the early 60s, those are the things we used to watch, you know, on Sunday afternoons and stuff, which was, you know, on old TV. But all this put aside, the emphasis, of course, whether it's with Leonidas, the 300, Samson, Hercules, all the rest, is on a very common biblical trait, and that is one of strength. Ancient Israelites were known to be intensely fierce. Biblical Israelites for the most part, when they acted properly, were feared. Go and look at your books of Joshua and Judges and Samuel and look at the way Israelites behaved in biblical times. They were tough-ass, mean, you-know-whats. When it says that the children of Israel went out of Egypt, the Hebrew word is hamushim. It means that they were armed. And even though for religious and spiritual reasons, God acted supernaturally, intervened supernaturally to take care of Egypt. After that, Israel had to act on its own. And when Amalek came, where were the thunderbolts from heaven? Where was the pillar of fire? It wasn't there. Instead, the children of Israel had to take those weapons that they got out of Egypt. And if you do your little historical study there, you can find that many of the ancient Israelites, instead of just building buildings, actually served in Pharaoh's military. And they had military means and ways about them. They were soldiers. They knew how to fight. So when Amalekites came in, who were Amalekites? 
these guys weren't like just some, you know, pandy ass guys coming around, you know. They were mean, tough, you know, terrorists. They were the pirates of the day. They were ruthless. They didn't come and attack the front guard of Israel. They attacked the weak. They attacked the back guard. That's nasty. That's like coming through the back door, all right, and attacking your kids rather than trying to attack you straightforward. That's nasty. But that's what Amalek did. And this is why it says, Ki yad al will be a, God swears on his throne, there will be war against Amalek throughout all the generations. And do not forget it. This is actually the point of this week's uh, Shabbat. is called Parashat Zahor. The week before Purim, the Shabbat before Purim, I should say, uh, we recite the words of the remembrance of Amalek in the synagogue. It is actually a positive commandment of the Torah. This is a mitzvah say, all right, of the Torah, that we remember what Amalek did. Okay, so you're going to read these verses. Yeah, yeah, I remember what Amalek did. Who today is Amalek? Do you think Amalek is gone? Oh, Amalek was the grandson of Esau. Oh, forget all that historical stuff. How does God say I'm going to fight from generation to generation against somebody who can't even identify today? The answer is we can identify Amalek today. And I'm going to tell you right now who Amalek is. And many of you are not going to like it. And I'm going to quote to you my sources so you will know exactly where they are. The Zohar itself. All right? Don't give me this with the Zohar, Shimon Bar Yochai, Moshe de Leon. I don't care. Okay, the Zohar is still a good source and an authoritative source of information. In the original, Helek Rishon, Dav Kav it states that there were five types of Erev Rav, the mixed multitude, in Israel, amongst the Jewish people, one type of which is called Amalek. So, the in quote spiritual identity of Amalek are a certain type of Jewish individual. Who? What? Well, again, I'm going to have to get politically incorrect here, and in violation, you know, I'm going against what I normally ever do about naming names, but I feel it's important now because, again, like this is a Torah commandment here, and I think it's very important that we really do what's necessary to identify the enemy before us. So I'm going to have to name names and if I offend many of your political sensibilities, oh well, not, no one's ever accused me of being politically correct. Amalek, all right, is the one who creates strife, division, hatred, and all the rest. These are the ones who come with the, you know, the banner of honor. It's like the wolf in sheep's clothing. Amalek is always the one who wants to come and, you know, have this grandiose idea of what is supposedly the utopian way and to get rid of you for being in the way of their utopia. Does that sound familiar to you? Take a look throughout all of Jewish history and the greatest scourges against the Jewish people have always been turncoat Jews themselves. In other words, the worst anti-Semites in the world are Jews who have turned against their own people. Sierra, sit down and behave. Sit down and behave. Do not interrupt the class. No more snacks now. Remember I always told you I don't believe in anything being an interruption or a distraction. Everything goes with the natural flow of things. Sierra is my, my, my canine daughter. And if she's here and she needs a little hug and a kiss, you know she's going to get my attention. But that's not going to distract us from talking about Amalek. Amalek is that spirit that seeks out the negative, the harmful effect upon the Jewish people. Any of that sound familiar to you today? How many of you have ever heard of the famous Catholic priest who pretty much started the Spanish Inquisition. A man named Tomas Torquemada. He was a Jewish convert, a Jewish turncoat, a traitor and an enemy to his people. 
Now, this is important because this is not just ancient history from hundreds of years ago. You know, I readily embrace our evangelical and Christian brothers and sisters. Here in Tennessee, there's some of the most greatest people I've ever met, and I welcome them and embrace them as my brothers and sisters, and they equally embrace me in return. But with that being said, there is one group, and many of you out there listening, be you know, if I'm going to be politically correct, incorrect here, the one group that I have found to be the most anti-Semitic, the most racist, the most the, the ones who propagate the most hatred against the religion of Judaism, our rabbis, and who and what we hold sacred today, aren't evangelical Christians. On the contrary, I consider them brothers and sisters. They're the turncoat Jews who have converted to Christianity today. And therefore feels that they're like Thomas Torquemada before them, on some kind of a mission to attack and destroy the holy works of our sages. I have seen books online, rabbinic Judaism debunked. I have been in, you know, crossing swords with many of these evangelical leaders, uh, Jewish ones who say, yeah, the rabbis are demonic and the Talmud is demonic, and all oh, you are worshiping demons, you're all going to hell. And you listen to this. This is, this is this is Nazi talk. And this is coming from Jews. Jews who have turned their back on their Judaism. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you a, a, a good example of this. Many of you might remember a very famous Jewish convert. What was his name? I think it was Zola. I, I, I forgot his name. Uh, he was once on, on a television program, and I used to monitor this stuff years and years ago. And uh, Zola Levitt, that's the guy, Zola Levitt. And he once gave a program where in his Jewish zeal, he says that his Christian uh, compatriots refused to embrace him because of his Judaism. And he felt that there was anti-Semitism towards him as a Jew amongst his fellow Christians. I thought that was curious. I wanted to talk to him about it. So, you know, they always had the, you know, on the television, they had the phone number to call, so fine. I called the number, because I wanted to speak with him. And I identified myself. I'm Rabbi Ariel Barzadog, the Kosher Torah School. I want to speak to Zola Levin. And they passed me from person to person to person. Finally, after about 10 minutes keeping me waiting, they said, Mr. Levitt refuses to speak to a Jewish rabbi who is not a believer in the Messiah. And they hung up the phone on me. That's nice, isn't it? That's nice. What an outreach that is. So I learned a lesson from this. There are other people who I crossed swords with over the many years. Remember, we started as an anti-missionary outreach program. This is why I try to build bridges to try to help our Christian brothers and sisters, of understanding that which binds us. And it's these self-same, self-hating Jews who try to burn all those bridges behind us. They, today, are Amalek. And that, let the truth be told. Yes, there are many of these, in quote, Jewish converts. And you know, I don't care what people believe. I don't care what people do. We've had members of our own school here who, for whatever reasons of their own, have chosen to become Christians. I have no objections. God bless. Be well. But don't turn on the Jewish people. Don't attack rabbis. Don't become the scourge. Because this is that nature, the zeal of the convert. This is that spirit of division and strife and attack. Because that's what Amalek did in the Bible. He attacked all the weak stragglers. And that's what these people today do. They say, do you know what Isaiah 53 says? And look at all the biblical prophecies. Who are they talking to when they talk like this? They're not talking to people educated in the Bible, like the forefront of, of, of a military, right? If any Christian wants to come to me and tell me what Isaiah 53 says, yeah, don't you know it talks about the Messiah? And I'll say, well, actually, there are a number of opinions in Judaism which says that it does. You're absolutely right. But that doesn't mean it has anything to do with Yeshua. But that's besides the point. 
But they talk to people who don't know any good, don't know the Bible, and they will reinterpret everything. Remember, in Christianity, you have hundreds of quotes. This is a messianic prophecy, and that's a messianic prophecy, and they're all fulfilled in, in, in Jesus. Okay, you know, if that's what you want to believe, go for it. I don't mind. All right? But that's not what the Bible really teaches. Oh, yes, it does. It has to teach only this way. See, that's the problem. Here's another way that you can recognize the spirit of Amalek. We today are living, let's be honest, in a cultural civil war. The cultural civil war is very, very bad. And it's a big problem. It's all over the Western world. It's not unique to the United States. Look at what's happening right now in Israel. Israel, for, now, for, for the third time in one year, because of its parliamentary system, has had elections to try to get a majority to run the government. And they failed. They failed the first time, they failed the second time. Now they had the third elections just the other day. And Mr. Netanyahu is again going to be given the opportunity to build a government. He, I, I bless him that, that he should succeed. I've always liked Mr. Netanyahu and I always will wish him success. And I wish that the people in Israel would only have the courage to abandon the parliamentary system completely. And as far as I'm concerned... Mr. Netanyahu can run the country until the day he dies. All right? In all due respect, uh, I, I feel that the parliamentary system in Israel has failed. Now, I didn't say democracy, even though I'm not a big fan of that either. But I'm not going to get into that right now. But now look at the nature of our cultural civil war. All right? If you talk to people who are referred to as conservatives... Conservatives will say, you know, we're, we're not for abortion, we're for, for gun rights, etc. and so on. We all know pretty much what the positions are. I don't need to elaborate. Most conservatives that I know will say, you know, these are our positions. This is what we hold. And we ask that you accept and respect them. You, your positions are over there. Our positions over here. And let's just agree to disagree. Whereas I've seen on the liberal side, they said, agree to disagree? Heck no. We're right, you're wrong, and you have to change like us. No, it's not okay, they say, the liberals say, that you have guns and we don't. No, you can't have guns either. You have to follow our way. You have to, and they shove their views down your throat. They enforce them upon you. I feel that's fundamentally wrong. Now, you might not like my opinions. And that's fine. I'm okay with that. As far as I'm concerned, I have absolutely no problem with prayers in public school. What do I care? When I was young, growing up in East Meadow High School, good on Long Island, we used to have a moment of silence to enable those individuals who wish to ask for God's blessings to do so uh, this day in accordance to their own beliefs. And it's drained into the head. You said that, you know, 18 years. Well, 12 years, actually. That's fine. I got no problems with that. Some people say, oh, what's the problem? You know, how dare you bring in God into the public school? You know something? It's from the time that we took God out of the public schools that all the crazy insanity started to go in because we lack morals and values. Remember the old saying, united we stand, Divided, we fall. And I believe in standing united. And all those forces which seek to divide are seeking to conquer. And that is modern day Amalek. And that's a problem. So, if you are of a certain religious or cultural or political point of view, I have no objections. Believe whatever you want. Practice however you want. But respect the other guy too. Let me be more politically incorrect here. Maybe I'll tick off some people if I do. No, too bad. We all know what the Bible says about homosexuality. The Bible says it's bad, it's wrong, it's an abomination. And isn't that enough reason that we should show disrespect and disregard the people of that practice? 
Well, you know something, I got a problem with that. I'm going to tell you why. Yeah. You know, I don't believe in disrespecting anybody. I have known members of the gay community for years and years, and members I know, nice people. And I've never had a problem with any of them. And I will show them respect, and I will give them dignity, because in my opinion, that's the right thing to do. I don't agree with their sexual practices. I don't agree with their positions, but they don't have to agree with mine either. And if God is so incensed with what they're doing, you know, the good Holy Lord can throw down his lightning bolts and do all these kinds of supernatural stuff. Don't expect me to do it. That's his job, not mine. But the Bible says that homosexuality is an abomination. You, know, you want to know something? Those who violate the Sabbath are also considered an abomination. Those who don't keep kosher for Passover is considered uh, abomination. So how many of you are showing disrespect and ill repute towards those who don't keep the Sabbath or those who violate the Passover? Or if you are of those people, that character, and you're going to show racism towards the gay community? Uh-uh. I don't buy that. You show respect towards everyone. All right? Now, like I said, I'm not going to disagree with what the Torah says about you know, gay and all the rest of that stuff. It, it, it says what it says. But I'm going to show respect. And I don't care who or what your sexual preference is. You want to come study our kosher Torah school? You're always welcome. I, you know, like I said, I've known members of the gay community for years and years, and they've always been the nicest people. So there, politically incorrect as it may be. I don't see the, the, the ones who I know trying to divide and conquer. But yet, like in every agenda, you have those who seek to cause harm. That's bad. And even in the gay community, they have to address their own issues. Just like Orthodox community, we have to address our issues. Everybody's got to address their own issues in their own backyards. That's just the way it is. No group is perfect. Now, with that being said, take a look at the agendas today and see how far extreme it's gone. You know what? Your sexual orientation is your business. If I meet you as a human being, I don't ask what your sexual orientation is. What do I care? I don't ask what your political orientation is. What do I care? I don't ask anything. If we meet and interact within a context, then that context is what's important. And that's all. Everything else, who cares? Well, it's part of my identity and it's important to me. Good for you. Mazel tov, as we say. But you don't have to wear, you know, like a neon t-shirt saying, accept, 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 and pushing it into somebody's face. Just chill out and relax. Seek to build bridges, not burn them. Take a look today at those people who are causing the most anti-Semitism. You know who they are? They are the ones who are essentially anti-Semitic, self-hating Jews. Take a look at our presidential elections today. You have people like uh, Bernie Sanders running for president of the United States. This guy he's a socialist, he's a communist, he holds all kinds of views which are fundamentally in opposition to the morals and values of what this country has stood for forever. And of course, he has his constituency, those who want to believe like him. But look at what his message is. And those who are looking at his message Beyond looking at the message, you know what they see? The Jew. Take a look at people like George Soros. I don't know Mr. Soros. I've never met him. I don't know anything about him other than what he is being portrayed as in the public media, which may or may not be true or false. Again, I have no idea. I, I don't wish to cast any aspersions on Mr. Soros other than to say when people look at him and what he does, they say he's the Jew. 
Mr. Sanders is married out of the faith. He's not a member of our faith. Like Thomas Purakamada before him, like Karl Marx before him, these are people who have gone out. They are ex-Jews. I would include Mr. Soros in that number. So, for those out there who want to be anti-Semitic, and they say, look at what these Jews are doing. Please, it's not us Jews doing this. It's those ex-Jews who are giving all Jews a bad name. Please do not associate us with them. They are Amalek today. Those who are causing the strife, the division, the hatred, the harm. Those who are burning the bridges rather than building them. Now, I don't know and I do not ask what your personal political views are in our United States. You can, of course, Hold by whatever political opinions that you wish. You can vote for whatever candidate you choose. This is not me trying to take any political position, whether it be Republican or, or, or Democrat or conservative or liberal. And all due respect, Ellie, you know, Rabbanit Ellie and I, we will both say, you know, there are views that we hold which are very, very conservative and others which others will call very, very liberal. And so where does that leave us? I guess where everything else is. But those of you who study with us Kabbalah, you understand how the Kabbalah always talks about the importance of Yehud, unity. And unity in the diagram of the tree of the ten sephirot is always set in the center column, where in which you do not embrace this or that extreme. We seek the center path. And it's in that center path that I believe needs to be our future. Because where we are at today, I think we are in the middle of a cultural civil war. And just yesterday, you had the likes of uh, Senator Schumer from New York, again, a secular Jew, uh, speaking in such heightened hyperbole that his words are interpreted to be an actual threat against conservative members of the United States Supreme Court. Now, did he actually mean to threaten anybody or not? You know, let, let the political pundits argue that. I want to believe that Senator Schumer would not have been so crazy to say something like that. But it's the nature of the rhetoric, the nature of what we say and how we are saying it. Somehow, some way, somewhere, this is going to explode just like it did back in 1860. And we don't need a second American Civil War. In Israel today, like I said, Mr. Netanyahu is going to try to form a third government. Uh, excuse me, a government now after the third elections. <laughs> Will he succeed? They might have yet a fourth election. It's the nature of their system. Now, somebody is making a comment here about Mashiach and things like that. You know, you think the Messiah can come? Go watch that program on Netflix that came out at the beginning of uh, 2020 called, uh, what was it called? Messiah, I think so, all right? Very interesting show. And... Um, very curious. Uh, recently, I was out uh, filming Ancient Aliens, and uh, Giorgio was with me. And that was the, one of the top topics that him and I talked about. And we were both on the same page. We understand things together. And the question, I, I said, if, if Mashiach really came today, forget it. Like in the film, everybody would dump on him. They'd call him a fraud. They'd call him a liar. There would be absolutely no way other than an absolutely over supernatural intervention to get anybody to give him any kind of credibility. So, you wonder why Mashiach doesn't come. Where is this credibility in anything about morals and character and value? See, that's the thing I'll, I'll share with you. Rabbi and Ellie and I were very, very emphatic. When we are going to judge somebody, we just had this conversation, I think it was at lunch today. When we're going to judge 
someone. Yeah, we do judge. We judge with every, every human being makes judgments all the time. We don't judge an individual by basis of color, race, sexual orientation, anything. Who cares? None of that matters. But we do judge by your character. What type of individual and person are you? Are you a decent, moral, good human being? Really? Then you're welcome. We open our doors to you. But if you are a lying, rotten, so-and-so, blah, 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 I don't care if you're a member of our own community, my door is closed to you. Because morals and values, in my opinion, are the most important things in the world. That is what we call in the Kabbalah, Tikkun Midot. Whether you study the Kabbalah of Abraham Abu Lafia from the prophetic traditions, or the mystical Kabbalah of the Arizal and the Rashash, they all agree that all the purpose of Kabbalah, prophetic ascent, mind expansion meditation, mind you, not only in our Jewish or Kabbalistic traditions, but in every single spiritual meditative tradition around the world is for one purpose, making ourselves better human beings and about living in this world and making this world better. That's what it's all about. Don't ask me about heaven or hell or the world to come because my attitude is but Larian. Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. Sorry if you don't like my language. Too bad. When I speak with evangelical Christians who are dead set to convert me, I frustrate them, unfortunately. Them, I guess. Because they say to me, don't you know who's a Jew? You're going to go to hell because you don't believe like we do, they say. I say, you know what? When I wake up every morning, I say a small little prayer. Lord, God, Hashem, I seek to serve you today, this day, and I'm going to do the best I can to serve you today. Please guide me how I can best serve you. Amen. That's it. And when I go into the afterlife and I stand at the great pearly gates and if Jesus is up there or the Virgin Mary or Muhammad or Krishna or Buddha, or I don't know, fill in the whatever pantheon you want up there. And they point a finger at me and say, you didn't have the right faith. You're going to hell. I will say my prayer and I say, Lord, you know, creator of the universe. I served you on earth every day of my life. I will continue to serve you every day in the afterlife. You want me to go to hell? Then I will go there and I'll serve you in hell just as much as I served you on earth. And if that's what you want, and that's what I'll do. <laughs> Many evangelicals can't handle that. They say, you have no fear of hell? I say, trust in God. That's what it all boils down to. When it comes to where we are in the world today, I trust in God. And I look at what's happening in our world, and while I trust in God, I have to confess my faith in the wisdom of my fellows is wavering. Because I see so many of us succumbing to, let me be blunt, mind control. No, I don't think that there are evil antennas out there from the CIA, NSA, uh, ancient, you know, aliens, or uh, fill in the blank of whoever conspiracy theory you want to believe in. They're not out there to control you and make you zombies. You know, please, you know what? We watch too much television and movies to believe that kind of nonsense. But at the same time, don't think that we're not being manipulated all the time by what is inundating us in the world today. Let's address the issue right now, the coronavirus. I made a small little video about this. It's on Facebook and, 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 and YouTube, my Patreon page. Go check it out. Let's review. Number one, the coronavirus is a very serious concern. It's a virus. But now, with that being said, obviously, people should take precautions so as not to expose themselves to a contagion to get sick. Thank God that the virus itself in its present form does not seem to be 
notoriously dangerous. It has about a 97% recovery rate for those who get sick. But that's now. Maybe it could, it, it could you know, evolve into a different form and, you know, become something worse. That's neither here nor there. We take precautions against illness. And that should be common sense. Whether it's against the flu or, the, or a cold. Where any kind of actual danger, we should take precautions to protect ourselves. No, you should not be paranoid. No, you should not panic. No, you do not need to freak out. This is not the bubonic plague. You don't need to take your bug out bags and hightail it to the hills. Not yet. Not yet. Probably not tomorrow either. Follow what the medical professions say. Wash your hands. Protect yourself. Do what's necessary. But take this basic lesson and learn from Purim how to apply it with everything else. Look at what happened. How was Haman overcome? Because Mordechai, Esther, took the necessary actions, precautions, to address the issue that was necessary to do. Esther confronted Haman in front of the king, and was able to persuade her husband to take her cause. But with that being said, remember the story in the book of Esther. The laws of ancient Persia could not be rescinded. They couldn't be canceled. They could not be undone or voted out. So the law to kill the Jews was officially on the books in 127 states of the old Persian Empire. That was the truth. What do you do about it? You couldn't get rid of the law. So what they did was made a new law. That the Jews had the right to rise up against their enemies the day before that other law would take effect. And if the Jews sat back and said, we're going to trust in God and we're going to say our prayers and we're going to read Psalms and God will, will bless us and our enemies will be reconciled to us and it'll be kumbaya and everybody will love one another. Well, we probably wouldn't be here today to have this discussion because our enemies would have risen up and killed us. So the Jews in ancient Persia had to pick up arms, kind of like in that movie, The Purge. And they had to seek out and kill their enemies. They didn't plunder them. They did not rob and rape and pillage. But they settled scores. And that is something that the modern day Israeli Secret Service, the Mossad, does. And that is something that our modern soldiers do. And that is something that, in my opinion, needs to be emulated. We have all too many victims in our world today. The Christian tradition teaches, turn your other cheek when you're slapped. Not our tradition. Our tradition to this day calls for an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And I agree with that. If you offended me, hurt me in some which way, and you are sincerely and honestly apologetic about it, I'll forgive you. I might not trust you again, but I'll forgive you. I'll give you that second chance. But if you are not sincere in your apology, and all you do is placate with words, I won't forgive, I won't forget, and I will never trust that individual again. And there are people like that to this day. You know, like I say, I will always be respectful, I will always be nice, but I will never turn my back on them because I don't trust them. There are people who I've known like this for many, many years. Who I cut off many, many years ago. And only recently do I find out that these same individuals who caused me trouble are now causing trouble for other innocent individuals. Well, as they say, fruit doesn't fall far from the tree. We have to recognize Amalek today in the modern forms that Amalek is. We have to address the issues of our modern cultural civil war. 
and recognize that united we stand or divided we fall. What's happening in Israel today? They got to address their stuff. They have to put together a functioning government. Today, the rhetoric against Mr. Trump is, is a billion percent wrong. It, it, it is beyond wrong. All right. People had rhetoric against Mr. Obama before they had before Mr. Trump. And they had rhetoric before uh, Mr. Uh, uh, <laughs> Mr. Bush. Now, you'll notice I always refer to a president in a respectful way. No, I did not agree with many of the policies of President Obama. But who cares? That doesn't matter. That's neither here nor there. But you show respect to a political leader. You show respect to the office that, and remember, in our traditions, we believe it is God who chooses our political leaders. Now, again, people who don't believe in God aren't going to believe that, and they're going to be disrespectful towards everything. They want to tear things down. We don't hold like that. And that is where our differences lie. And we have to be strong like lions and not turn the other cheek, but to confront those who are not willing to show the respect to us that they demand that we show to them. Okay? Let me just tell you this. For those of you who you know don't already know, right? Like I said, I will show respect to people who are of the gay community. I have absolutely no reason not to show respect, and I have a million reasons to show respect. You're gonna show respect back to me, yes? I certainly hope so. I'm heterosexual, I'm married to a beautiful woman. Right? Not another guy. I hope you're okay with that. I hope you're cool with that. Okay? I believe very firmly in the Second Amendment of the United States Constitution. I believe guns should be in the hands of everybody. Not for hunting. For self-defense. The intent and purpose of the Second Amendment was that people had the right of self-defense, even against their own government. I believe that too. And in that respect, you know what? No one that I know goes hunting with an AR-15 rifle. So to try to say assault rifles are for hunting, well, if you're a hunter, <laughs> you hunt with your AR-15. What are you hunting? I know what hunting is like. I, I live in Monroe County in the rural area. All my neighbors hunted. All right? I had friends in Monroe County years back uh, who literally never ate any meat that they themselves did not hunt for their families. And that's just the way it was. I mean, we're talking about, you know, hillbilly types goes back centuries in the woods down here. And that's great. I honor and I respect those traditions. Not anybody that I know is hunting with an AR-15 or an AK-47. Just not. What do you have those weapons for? Other reasons. Self-defense. Fine. If that, in my opinion, in our country, that is fine. You go to other countries, Europe, and even in Israel, soldiers in Israel have guns, not the everyday citizenry. If you today were to move to Israel and apply for a gun license, you're not going to get it. Israel is very strict with those things. If you're a soldier, <laughs> you're walking around with an M16 on your back. Big difference. Now, in our country here, yes, obviously, we don't want firearms to fall into the hands of dangerous people who are going to use them irresponsibly. But that is why, in my opinion, you need people who are responsible to be able to defend themselves at any and all times. So, there has been the idea of arming teachers and other people in public schools so that, God forbid, if there was ever an issue that you would have responsible citizens to take on self-defense. I agree with that a million percent. We had the episode, what was it, Fort Lauderdale, where in which you had the police officer who refused to engage a, 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 a violent perpetrator of a crime and, and innocent children would be murdered while he just stood there. I think they wanted to prosecute him. I'd throw him in jail for the rest of his life. Coward, it's terrible. Yeah, I know, there's always, always different sides, but that's the side that I see. Now, with that being said, 
How many times here in the United States do we hear people who invade people's homes and they get shot and killed? You know what? Them's the breaks. You don't do violent crimes. You do violent crimes and you succumb to violence. That's just the way it is. Learn not to be violent. If you are a Jewish individual, and as we see, there is growing anti-Semitism on the streets here of the United States. Most Jews act like Christians. They turn their other cheek. That's not the Jewish way. If you saw a gang member of one of the dangerous gangs, of any racial group that you choose, right? Biker gangs, race gang, whatever, right? Go up to them, slap them in the face. Say, I despise you and your group. What would happen? Give you two seconds to think before you know that that guy would either, or that woman, would either beat the living snots out of you or take out some kind of a violent weapon and, and, and put an end to you. That's fear. That's why you don't do things like that, because you recognize these individuals are dangerous. Would you go up to a Navy SEAL and spit in their face and say, I despise the military? Would you go up to a Special Forces soldier from Russian Spetsnaz, Israeli uh, Sayeret Matkal, our Navy SEALs, British Special Forces, spit in their face, I despise you. All right? I despise your military. Most soldiers would have the discipline to grin and bear it. Right? But if not, they'd snuff out your life like that with a single blow. You don't do things like that and you darn well know it. People should have respect or fear of Jewish individuals who should be like their biblical ancient counterparts of being tough and mean and lean. And if you ever hit one, you should know that person is going to go nuts on you. And you should therefore say, I would never attack you. They're crazy, right? You attack them, they'll, they'll try to kill you. Well, as long as you have the reputation of being a victim, as long as you act like you can be a victim, well, what do you know? What a surprise that you then become victimized. Is that really a surprise to you? The Jews in ancient Persia could not sit back and allow themselves to be victimized surrounded by hostile enemies, numbering in the tens of thousands. Read your book of Esther. They had to rise up and take matters into their own hands. Where was God in all this? God's everywhere. We all know that. But the reason why God is not mentioned in the book of Esther, as the Kabbalah, the Arisa, makes very clear to us, is to show that we have responsibilities, we have obligations, and if we don't rise up and fulfill our responsibilities and obligations, then no one else is, not even God. And that makes your prayers valueless and meaningless and worthless if you are not willing to become the vessel for your own prayers to be answered. Does that not make sense to you? If I am praying to God, Dear Lord, I have a medical problem. Please help me get better. And as if the little voice of God is saying in my head, well, how about if you eat better and if you exercise better, you will therefore make your life better, your health better. Gee, that makes a lot of sense. God, thanks a lot. I appreciate And then you do the right thing. Now, that's not a cure-all and end-all for everything. I know. But you understand the concept of what I'm saying. We have responsibilities. If we want to overcome, we want to win the cultural civil war in which we're living. The victory is not war or violence and defeat of the other guy burning them down. It's building the bridges, finding the commonality, finding a way to make shalom, peace, holding the unity together, remembering united we stand, the Bible. So for those of you who are Jewish converts to Christianity, stop attacking my Judaism. You've made your choices. God bless you. Go believe what you want. Stop attacking others.
who don't believe like you. Stop calling us names. Stop insulting us. Stop doing all this negative stuff because I'm going to attack back. I'm not going to call you names. I'm not going to insult you. I'm not going to say you're demonic and stupid and this and that. But I will expose your racism. I will expose your hatred. And I'm going to confront you and make you deal with it. And I will not embrace you. And I will not accept you as long as you are sowing strife and division. Come back to unity. As I said, to my Christian brothers and sisters out there, we've got so much that unites us. And I'll include them within this, our, our, our Islamic brothers and sisters. There is no reason for Muslims and Jews to be warring. It's just not. We don't have to embrace the extremist elements of separation. We need to embrace those things which unite us. All the Jews in ancient Persia united together in common cause to confront a necessary evil. And because of such, they were successful. In the last century, good and moral nations from around this world stood together in confrontation of the evils of Nazism. And confronted with a violent war because it was necessary to confront that evil. Today, we have equal evils. It's not just an evil of a hatred against Jews. It's a hatred and a racism towards all the other groups. We cannot condone this. We cannot be part of this. We must confront it. Yeah, we're not all going to agree. We're not going to all embrace one another's views, but we have to learn to get along. <laughs> Rodney King, for all that was worth. All right, you understand what I'm saying? We got to be able to stand together, regardless of our differences. That is the most important thing. Do you think all the Jews in ancient Persia didn't have all these different groups and, 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 and divisions like we have today? But of course. But they had to learn to put those divisions aside to stand together. That is what we need to do today. Many of you might remember a, a, a speech made by the American President Ronald Reagan back in the 1980s. When he stood in front of the United Nations and said, look how divided we are amongst the nations. But how quickly would we come together, all nations of the world, if we were together to face a threat from outer space? Well, I'm not going to elaborate on that one right now, but I'll just tell you, Mr. Reagan knew something then. And Mr. Trump knows something today with the creation of our Space Force. You can elaborate all you want. Do I know secrets that you don't? Probably. But what difference does that make? My point is, united we stand and divided we fall. Keep your commitments. Keep your responsibilities. That is the most important essential thing. Always be compassionate. Always be decent and moral. Even to a little doggy like Sierra sitting here at my side. And like I said to you, right? No distractions. Everything is here to teach us lessons about building what we need to build. But we're building strength. We build with power. We build with might. Robin Eteli will tell you we go to the gym, we work out, we're tough, we're strong. Um, one of the individuals who she actually exposed me to, very popular today, is Jocko Willick. Jocko Willick's an ex-Navy SEAL who has promotional types of videos and teachings uh, which really teach people how to be tough and strong. I encourage your involvement with these types of programs. Do what's necessary to make yourself a victor and not a victim. Be the lion, not the lamb. Eye for an eye, not turn the other cheek. And no, I'm not presenting or espousing violence. I don't believe in violence. But if and when violence is necessary, then you got to do what you got to do. Wise words of our sages. If you know your enemy is coming to cause you harm, don't wait for him to come to you. You rise up and go to him. And if necessary, you even ambush him along the way. Prevent him from doing the harm that he seeks to do. 
So thank God that we do have intelligence services around the world who are seeking out the quote, bad guys and hopefully disposing of them before they try to dispose of us. We got bad guys all around us. These are the malevolent ones, the bad mouth ones, the one spewing hate, violence, and division. Cut them off. Confront them. Don't let it spread. For like a cancer, it will grow and kill. We can learn the lesson from Purim, expose our modern day Amaleks, and stand against that which seeks to divide and destroy. And we will build and unite. That is our kosher Torah message. That's my message. And I try to instill this in all the teachings that we have for our school. And I encourage you, check out our courses online. See what they even have sale. Go crazy rabbi. Reminds me of the old crazy Eddie commercials from you know New York 1980s, for those of you who might remember. Check out what we offer. See for yourselves if we are not worthy of your support, standing together, working together, learning together. For those who become our students by school or supporting us on a monthly basis, you know the one thing that I offer is myself. I want to talk with you. I want to get to know you. I want to be friends with you. I want to interact and share and work together because that's the way a real rabbi Kabbalist needs to be with students. I don't want to just be an image that you're going to see here on Facebook or YouTube, Patreon, or wherever you're seeing this video. I want to work with you. You want to work with me? I'm here. That's all you got to do. If you're interested in joining our school, working with me, my name, Ariel Sadok at gmail.com. Be in touch. Check out what I have to offer. Let's be part of the cure and not part of the problem. Let's be part of healing and not part of the illness. That's the Purim message. So, you're going to go out to Purim. A, don't get drunk. Enjoy. Stay safe from the coronavirus. Do what you need to protect yourselves. And learn from this. Protect yourselves and everywhere else. I'm Ariel Bartzadok from the Kosher Tour School. Looking forward to working with you. If I don't talk to you before the holiday, hug Purim Sameach. Shalom.